Welcome back. Let's go ahead and check out the turtles. Okay, so we are on slide 94 out of 165. So we're moving and grooving. Uh, your turtles are gonna have very distinctive traits uh, that mean it's going to include the lack of the holes in the skull behind the eye socket. So you're going to find that difference between that um, and the reptiles we're talking about. So new fossil evidence show that turtles uh, once had, but they lost those skull hole holes over the course of evolution. And so all of your turtles have a box like shell um, made of upper and lower shields and that are fused to the vertebrae the clavicles and the ribs. So you can't take the shell off basically is uh, the take home on that. Sorry about that, I stopped the recording. All righty, so some of your turtles have adapted to deserts, other live in waters, ponds, rivers, etc. The largest turtles in the world are gonna live in the sea. And so obviously, you know, we're talking about a sea turtle. So many of your species of your sea turtles are gonna be endangered uh, by accidental capture in fishing nets um, and development of beaches because it's really important that uh, they have beaches to lay their eggs on. And so there are many conservation efforts that take place. As a matter of fact, uh, when I was in Panama, I was involved in one of them. Uh, so basically they have specific places in which they know when the turtles are going to come lay eggs and uh, nightly you will actually go out watch the turtles lay their eggs and then um, you will basically plot where they lay their eggs and that plot will be um, that plot will be sometimes preserved and carefully watched but a lot of times those eggs are digged up and moved to an alternative plot, uh, one that is not going to be, um, one that is not going to be basically known. So uh, they do this to help to preserve the eggs. A lot of times what happens too, uh, when the eggs are laid right away, you're going to have different rodents that are gonna go ahead and come up and dig. And so it's very important that those plots get protected. Um, All righty, so next is gonna be your crocodilians. Your crocodilians, your alligators and your crocodiles, they belong to the Archosaur uh, lineage that is going to be dating back to the late Triassic. And so your living crocodilians are gonna be restricted to your warmer regions because they are ectothermic. And since they are ectothermic, they need to uh, be able to control their body temperature via, um, they don't control it, but uh, they are going to have body temperatures similar to the outside environment. And so birds are also archosaurs, uh, but almost every feature of their reptilian anatomy has been modified in their adapt adaptation to flight. And so your derived characteristics of birds. So many of your characters of birds are gonna be adaptations all about facilitating flight. And so the most obvious is going to be the wings, the wings with your keratin fibers. And so other weight saving adaptations are gonna be the fact that they, um, they lack a urinary bladder Okay, females only have one ovary. Uh, they have small gonads, um, the, the uh, male's small gonads, loss of teeth, uh, and it's not written on here either, but their bones are going to be more hollow than that of other organisms. And so it's right here, you can see the hollowed out bone. Uh, that's obviously going to make them lighter in order to go ahead and achieve flight. And so just looking at your avian wing, you can see that these are modified bones. You can see this one here is gonna be the humerus. This one right here at the elbow joint, that is the ulna. This is the radius. This is gonna be modif modified carpal bones, okay? The phalanges, 
uh, finger one, you've got your palm, finger two, finger three. And so it still has those type of bones. They're homologous structures. We talked about that in class the other day, but uh, they're modified structures specifically for flight. And so flight is gonna enhance hunting for the birds. It's gonna enhance scavenging, um, escape from terrestrial predators. I mean, it makes total sense, right? I mean, if a bird's gonna get uh, attacked, it just flies away uh, versus the organism that's attacking it. It's just like, hey, I can't fly away. Also migration. A lot of different birds are gonna migrate during different seasons. So they're gonna have different migration patterns. And so your flight is gonna require energy expenditure. And so it's also gonna acquire acute vision, fine muscle control. And so these are things that birds have adapted. And so your birds are generally gonna be very complex in their behavioral patterns. Uh, they usually have very elaborate courtship rituals. Uh, we've discussed the, the dance of the blue-footed booby uh, in our past chapters. I haven't actually jumped up and started dancing with you what I have in my past classes. That way I can show you how a bird will dance around and try to win over a mate, but it's pretty cool. Um, so fertilization of birds is going to be internal. The eggs and the developing embryos inside, they have to be kept warm uh, through brooding by one parent or even both parents. And so those eggs, once they're leg, laid, somebody has to sit on them. And that's what that means by brooding. And so through the origin of birds. And so the birds are most likely to have descended from smaller theropods, uh, a group of carnivorous dinosaurs. Okay, so your feathers evolved before flight was adapted. And so it is actually thought that the feathers were a product, uh, they were a structure originally used for insulation, for camouflage, or possibly to be pretty during that courtship dance. And then eventually, through what is called an exaptation, we've discussed the term exaptation, that those feathers uh, eventually adapted for flight. And so, as you can see here, here is the early, uh, the early bird <laughs> with his early feathers. By 160 million years ago, those feathered theropods evolved into birds. And so what we see now of one of the earliest birds is gonna be Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx, Archaeopteryx is one of the oldest known birds. And through the fossils of Archaeopteryx, we have actually seen the feathers of that Archaeopteryx. We've seen the, you can see the toothed beak. Uh, it has claws on the ends of its wings. A long tail with many vertebrae. And so it, it retained ancestral characteristics, those teeth, claw, and long tail. Your living birds now though, your living birds belong to a clade of Neorth Neorthes. Uh, <laughs> yes. So several groups of those birds are going to include more than one or more flightless birds. So the raddies are going to be flightless birds. Your penguins, they're going to use pectoral muscles to, quote, fly in the water, but they are not truly flying. And then there's certain species of rails, ducks, and pigeons that are also flightless. So here's one of your raddies. Your example is gonna be your emu. Uh, you've probably seen uh, an ostrich before. Well, emus, ostrich are very similar, but there are also some very distinct differences. And so here is your penguin, sorry about that, that is quote unquote flying underwater. Your penguin is a bird, but as you can see, his feathers are not adapted for flight, but his feathers are adapted to basically sail through the water. So, well, hello there, sorry about that. So your demands of flight, um, they have rendered different body forms 
for many of the flying birds. So you will find that those who fly in similar patterns are going to have similar types of body forms and be similar to one another versus those that, um, like for example, gliders, your birds of prey, they're going to have very different body frames and patterns than other birds. And so your bird species can be distinguished by characters, including the profile, uh, how they look from side or how they just overall look, uh, their color, their flying style, their beak, uh, beak shape, their behavior, their foot structure, even uh, the foot structure of some birds versus the talon of the bird of prey uh, are going to be very, very different and adapted specifically to uh, their mode of nutrition and their uh, mode of predation, I should say. So looking at this guy here, you can see he's a very specialized beak and his specialized beak is going to be just for that, for getting his prey out of the water, uh, his little shrimp out of the water. And then versus a hummingbird, a hummingbird's beak is specialized and perfectly shaped. It has a perfect puzzle piece shape to fit in to very specific flowers. So the beak of the hummingbird is going to insert into here. And then his long tongue is going to go down into the flower where it's going to get its tasty nectar treat. Well, as you can see, this bird's beak is adapted to this flower shape and vice versa. So essentially, these two organisms evolved together in the same direction, forcing he has basically forced this one to evolve that shape and this one forced this. Why? Because the flower that doesn't have that perfect puzzle piece shape is not going to get uh, pollinate, uh, is not going to uh, receive pollinization from this bird. And so they essentially have evolved together. All right, moving on to the mammals. Uh, your mammals are going to be amniotes. They have hair, milk production. Mammals, the class is mammalia. Uh, they're represented by 5,300 species. Uh, your mammals, what are the characteristics of your mammals? Uh, they have mammary glands that produce milk. They have hair and fat lying under the skin. And the purpose of this is insulation. And you might see some mammals that you're like, it doesn't have hair. Well, your mammals are going to have some remnants of hair. So in the case of your dolphins, have you looked up in his nose? Yeah, exactly. So uh, your mammals are going to have kidneys. And the purpose of the kidneys is to conserve water from waste. Uh, mammals are endothermic and have high meta metabolic rates. Um, they have efficient respiratory and circulatory systems. Very large brain to body ratio. Um, they have extensive parental care. Now, this is generalization. Not all mammals have extensive parental care, but we can go ahead and generalize because you do have a majority of those mammals that have extensive parental care. And differential teeth. So differential teeth is, if you look at your own mouth, you can see the teeth on the front are very different than the two set of teeth on the side are different than those next set of teeth leading to the molars also being different teeth. And so that is a characteristic of a mammal. And so when you see here, uh, your mammals, basically they have adapted uh, to basically uh, the lack of water. And so they do that through uh, through basically the kidneys have that ability to conserve water. So you're looking at here, the kangaroo rat, rat has adapted to extremely dry heat. And so early evolution of your mammals, uh, your mammals belong to a group of amniotes called synapsids. If you recall, when I looked at that clade, when we first started this talk, we talked about the synapses having a single hole behind the eye socket uh, on each, uh, I'm sorry, they have a single hole behind the eye socket on each side of the skull for the attachment of the jaw muscle. 
there are two bones that make up that jaw muscle in early synapsids. Uh, they were eventually incorporated into the middle ear. So when you look here, um, your middle ear bone, so these are your present day reptiles, okay? These are gonna be your present day mammals. And so you can see here in your present day reptile, it has an eardrum. And then in the middle ear, it has a bone called the stapes. And the stapes is going to be that connection between the eardrum and the inner ear. And so in the mammalian ear, the mammalian ear, if you look here, here's the middle ear, here's your eardrum, you have more bones involved and you have modification of the stapes. So you can see here, this is the bone called the stapes. Okay, you have your incus, which is attached to it, and you got your malleus. And so these are what allow uh, the mammals to have the ability for more intricate sound. And so your synapsids, uh, they evolved into large herbivores and carnivores during that Permian period. Uh, your mammal-like synapses, they emerged at the end of the Triassic. So the key here is mammal-like synapses. We weren't quite there yet, but they were on their way. And so those first true mammals, they arose during the Jurassic period is when the true mammals arose. So that's about 201 to 145 million years ago. So by the early Cretaceous, though the three living lineages of mammals have emerged and have been constant. And those are going to be your monotremes, your marsupials, and your eutherans. And so with that, your mammals, once they emerge, they underwent adaptive radiation. And so they spread. And as through they spread, they evolved. They ended up ad adapting and more and more species came about. And so this took place after the extinction of the large dinosaurs the pterosaurs and the marine reptiles that were present during that late Cretaceous period. So your monotremes. Uh, your monotremes are going to be a very much smaller group. Uh, they are a group of egg-laying mammals. So examples are, that you may have heard of are going to be your echidnas and your platypus or your platypi. Uh, your females, they lack nipples. They secrete milk from glands from their bellies. <laughs> Sorry, I think that's funny. Uh, so the baby will suck on the mother's fur rather than sucking on a teat. Your marsupials are going to include organisms such as your opossums, your kangaroos, and your koalas. And so in a marsupial, what happens is the embryo is going to develop in the mother's uterus, and it's going to be nourished by the placenta. So what happens first is the marsupial is going to be born really, really earlier in embryonic development. And it is born, it's going to come out of the vagina, it's going to crawl up into the pouch of the mother, where it's going to attach to a teat. Uh, and there it will nourish, it will, it will continue nursing to get its nourishment. And so that maternal pouch is called a marsupium. And so essentially marsupials have two births. They have the original birth of that early embryo when it finds its way up to the pouch. And then when this embryo grows into a uh, fetus and it grows into a small, uh, I guess you would say a child, <laughs> is, is going to go ahead and be born again. And so in your marsupials, so some of your species are going to open to the front of the mother's body. It's kind of crazy. So just like your, just like your kangaroo, the pouch is in the front, but in other species, the pou pouch is facing behind. And so, yeah. And so basically it would be like the baby just hopping in the mother's behind their derriere. But just know it's not jumping in their anus, it's jumping in a pouch that is just faced out the back. And so 
in Australia, convergent evolution has resulted in that diversity of marsupials. And those diversity of marsupials has led to forms that resemble eutherians in other parts of the world. And so you can usually find a representative eutherian and marsupial that are very similar. And so plant, uh, plantigale and a deer mouse, very similar. This is the marsupial form. This is the eutherian form. Eutherian form means that they have a placenta. And so uh, they are called placental mammals. And then you got your marsupial mole, and then you got your regular mole. I'm going to call this version regular because I guess that's what we're used to. But if I were in Australia or if I were in New Zealand, I would probably call this the regular one, but I'm not. So here is your sugar glider, which is your marsupial. And here is your regular flying squirrel, which is eutherian. You have yourself a wombat marsupial and its equivalent would be a woodchuck. So how much wood would a woodchuck chuck if it was just a regular woodchuck? You have your Tasmanian devil versus the wolverine. You got your kangaroo versus your Patagonian cavi. So let's move on to eutherians, which are placental mammals. Um, compared with your marsupials, there are more eutherians than your marsupials. Eutherians have a more complex placenta. That's why they have, uh, are called placental mammals, okay? So your young eutherians are gonna complete their embryonic development within the uterus. And they are going to be attached to the placenta and the placenta is where they get their nutrition through. And so molecular morphological data has given that conflicting dates on that diversification of the eutherians and what, uh, what year they came about. Molecular data suggests about 100 million years ago. Morphological data is going to indicate about 60 million years ago. And so here is that nice clade. We just went over it. Monotremes. Uh, monotremes are going to have five species representative that are extant now. Remember, extant means current. Uh, marsupials, about 324 species. Eutherians are going to be about 5,000. 10 different species. All righty. So I feel that this is stuff we've already said, but this looks like some good pictures that you can go over. Well, we said this, but let's go ahead and go over some of the orders, uh, the orders of your eutherians. So you have your elephants, uh, Proboscidea, uh, you got your proboscidea, long muscular trunk, thick loose skin, upper incisors, elongated as tusks. And so Serenia is going to be your um, manatees and your du dugongs. And so they are aquatic, fin like forelimbs, no hind limbs, as you can see. They are herbivores. Oh, I love these names. Uh, Tubla dentata. Okay, there we go. How about I just go with aardvark? Okay, got teeth consisting thin tubes cemented together. That is crazy, but it's specialized for what they eat. Ants and termites. Your hyrax, you got your rock hyrax. Short stubby legs. They got stumpy tails. They're herbivores, complex multi-chamber stomachs. Moving on to the next set of orders, uh, we're going to go Xenarthra is going to be your sloth, anteaters, and armadillos. And so reduce reduction of the teeth or no teeth, herbivores or carnivores. Okay, so big differences just within the same order. Uh, Lagomorpha is going to be your rabbits, your hares, and your pikas. They got the chisel-like incisors. Uh, hind legs are going to be longer than the forelegs, and they're great. They're adapted for running and jumping, and they are also herbivores. Rodentia is going to include your squirrels, beavers, rats, porcupine, and mice. 
And so here's your little example of your red squirrel. They got chisel like continuously growing incisors. So a little bit different. They get worn down by gnawing. So that is why, like, for example, your uh, beavers constantly chewing on wood because they have to wear down your teeth. If you've ever had a mice mouse in your house, you might have discovered that because they literally just chewed and chewed a hole in a door. And so that's what they do is they constantly have to chew and chew and chew and it wears down those continuously growing incisors. So you get yourself the order of primates. Order of primates is gonna include lemurs, monkeys, chimpanzees, gorillas, and humans. And so what are their characteristics? Opposable thumbs. This is important in order for you them to climb from tree to tree. Forward facing eyes. This is important for depth perception in order for them to jump from one tree to the next. Yeah, it's pretty important that they have really good depth perception and that's where the forward facing eye comes in. Well-developed cerebral cortex that is going to be uh, really important in problem solving and omnivores. Omnivores means that they are both herbivores and carnivores. Let's go to the next order of carnivora, including your dogs, wolves, bears, cats, weasels, otters, seals, and walruses. And so here's just showing your coyote as an example. They got sharp pointed canine teeth um, and molars for shearing. And so they, they eat raw meat, so they got a shear and cut is basically what it is. Um, Cetartio dactyla. That sounds good. Cetartio dactyla. That's going to include um, your artiodactyls, your sheep, your pigs, cattle, deer, and giraffes. And it's showing your nice bighorn sheep here. Uh, they have hooves with an even number of toes, okay, for each foot. Uh, they are herbivores. And you got your cetaceans. Your cetaceans are going to be your whales, dolphins, and porpoises. And so it's showing you your Pacific white-sided porpoise. They're aquatic, obviously, streamlined, paddle-like forelimbs, no hind limbs, uh, they have a thick layer of insulated blubber, and these babies are carnivores, so watch out. Ah, oh, we're moving on, we're moving on. Um, so parasodactyla, that's going to include your horses, your zebras, tapirs, rhinoceros. And so they're going to have hooves with odd number of toes on each foot, and they are herbivores versus... Uh, your other ones had even number of toes. All righty. Uh, Dropterra is going to include your bats. They are adapted for flight. Broad skin folds that is going to extend from their elongated fingers. They, you have several different, they could be carnivores. They could be herbivores. They could be bloodletting and eating. That's not put here, but I guess that's supposed to fall in with carnivores. Um, you also have, oh, you have also have insectivores. They're not putting insectivores on there either. So they're probably putting that with carnivores too. Um, you lipped, let's just go ahead and call it a star nosed mole. And I hope that gave you a little chuckle at home. Why don't you go ahead and practice that word? And I bet you, you'll get it. <laughs> so star nosed mole is mainly going to eat your insects and other small inverts. Wow, we made it. So we made it to the primates. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to call it, and I'm going to go ahead and, and um, lecture on primates in class because it is actually my favorite. So I want to go ahead and, and do that together. Let's go ahead and stop share. So let's take a peek on what that put us at. Hmm. Well, I don't know where it went, but that's okay. So thank you for being such a good listener. I'm sorry if it was very um, monotonous with me reading through the slides, 
but I hope I gave you some little examples or just somebody to read with you. All right. Have a good day. Bye.